All right, team, we are back with the Just Show Up podcast. All right, we took a week off. Coach Show took some little time to himself, which is good. It's always great to have a nice little reset, even for myself, just taking a week off the podcast for us to, uh, you know, just kind of rethink some ideas of what we're going to bring back to you. So uh, let's get uh, grounded here. Let's take a few breaths. Sit up tall. Get organized here, just grounding yourself in your space. Preparing for our topic of today, of the day, which is uh, going back to our history of the CrossFit Games. Let's get right into our three breaths. Take a nice deep inhale through your nose. Hold. Exhale. Breath in, hold, exhale, last one, big hold here, three, two, and let it out. Love it. And always important to take our three breaths, right? Got to get yourselves uh, in the right mindset to listen to uh, a fun one today. So, Coach Joe, what's our uh, topic for a quote? All right. So, uh, as I was away on vacation last week, got a lot of reading in. Yes. Um, so, I was, I'm into uh, reading Michael Pollan's new book, the How to Change Your Mind. Uh, awesome book. Awesome book. Um, and a quote from it says, our task in life consists precisely in a form of letting go of fear and expectations, an attempt to purely give oneself to the impact of the present. Um, so if you haven't read any Michael Pollan, he wrote The Omnivore's, Omnivore's Dilemma, and then How to Change Your Mind, uh, What the New Science of Psychedelics Teach Us About Consciousness, Dying, Addiction, Depression, and Transcendence. So he's awesome. His books are awesome. That's the uh, MFP oh, book club wreck of the oh week. Oh my gosh. Can uh, promote this book and is um, he basically took the uh, concept of the book and made it into a Netflix show. Yes. So if you're not a reader, um, <laughs> highly recommend to watch the series on Netflix, How to Change Your Mind. Um, obviously, with me being a, a huge advocate for plant medicine and psychedelics and how that's going to essentially come out into our, our society more and more over the next, you know, five to 10 years and being a a forerunner and how these things are actually allowing us to really grow as a society and grow as individuals. Yeah. Um, I can't say obviously, you know, enough good things about that. And I think at some point we'll have a, a podcast topic to really maybe touch on this a little bit deeper. But uh, for today, we are going to talk about the CrossFit Games because uh, this upcoming weekend will be the, let's see, 10, oh my gosh. Let me do my math here. 10, uh, 18 years. Yeah, I think it's the 18th CrossFit 18th, 18th CrossFit. Get holy moly. Um, and time flies. I mean, it's – we'll go over the history of the CrossFit Games in a little bit, but just so you guys know, it'll happen. Um, it will actually start this Thursday or maybe Wednesday. I'll check to see. Sometimes they start a little bit earlier. But uh, basically they go through a, a whole week – and or maybe sometimes a week long of competition using the CrossFit methodology that some of you guys are mostly familiar with or some just kind of getting familiar with. And uh, yeah, it's a whole new world of, of a way of, of exploring fitness and really understanding a part of our community that is really essential to, you know, show, showcasing what, you know, this approach to improving yourself physically can do for you. Um, so, John, I don't know if you want to touch on anything about your excitement for this upcoming weekend. Yeah, I mean, every, out. you know, the CrossFit Games is, like, just such a, a cool spectacle to watch. Because, like, I think of it, like, I see it more as, like, a festival. Like, because I, I was lucky enough. So, I went to the CrossFit Games as a spectator, mm -hmm. as a spectator in uh, 2018. And it was just so awesome. Like, just thousands of people there just to, like... Honestly, and it was so different than any other like competitive environment because it wasn't like there were fans of certain teams. Like it was just people there supporting fitness. Um, and I think that, you know, the CrossFit Games, although it is 
very, very different than like the daily life of affiliates. Um, it is super important just to like, you know, be mindful of and just to appreciate as some as like someone who participates in CrossFit every day, because it is just like, it's such a, um, a spectacle of like one, like human potential. They, these people are incredibly just impressive in what they can do. Um, but also it's just like a very, um, I just find it to be super compelling. Like, I just mm -hmm. think that seeing people push themselves at that level, but also support each other is really cool. So I think everybody who steps foot in a CrossFit gym should just in general, know a little bit about the history and like what the games are. Yeah. And it's, uh, you actually touched on, you know, this idea of, you know, what we do on a day to day basis, does not necessarily resemble to some extent of like what they're doing in terms of volume, intensity, skill level. But we, we want to remember is that the methodology in its essence of what they're doing is exactly the same. Um, so yeah, a few things, you know, it's, it's, it's a really exciting time to, to, you know, do CrossFit to watch. And if you go on the games.crossfit.com website, you'll be able to see, uh, you know, how you can just watch on YouTube or even ESPN this year, which will be really exciting. So what I wanted to do to start is to give you guys a little background about, you know, how this idea of the CrossFit games even came to be, because again, remember that CrossFit, when it first was originally developed by Greg Glassman in the early 2000s, it was purely set to be a form of, of improving our health, mm -hmm. right? That was the main, that is always and will continue to be the main goal of what CrossFit is. It's a health and wellness program, and particularly using the tool of physical fitness to accelerate how we improve that. And so when this methodology of CrossFit was developed, it was so unique because we incorporated or Greg Glass when he developed incorporated all the different elements that are within individualized fitness programs. So say, for example, we had different forms of weightlifting, different forms of rowing, biking, you know, running, swimming, different forms of doing body weight gymnastics. Um, and then how all that integrates into uh, this concept of work capacity and a achieving these things using methods of time and methods of reps and loads. And, uh, you know, that was really how the method started. And then we have the variance aspect, yeah. right? Where it's not just about being, you know, sufficient or efficient in one of these elements. It's about how do you balance yourself as a whole to learn these things? Not they're saying you're going to have to be, you know, great at one of these things, but, it's about learning these and implementing because the standard of fitness and how they define fitness is unique to being able to doing all those. And so as Greg developed the, the methodology of learning all these new skills and bringing about these workouts, the uh, two individuals are Dave Castro and Tony Budding, um, who were level one uh, trainers for Greg, and they really were advocates of the methodology and teaching people about CrossFit. Um, Dave having a background in Navy SEALs and Tony having a background in doing organized uh, events came about this idea of starting this CrossFit Games. And so what they were noticing is in the early 2000s that on CrossFit.com, they posted a daily workout of the day. And you could still go on CrossFit.com and still see a daily wide. Um, and so in those early 2000 years, they were seeing people post in the comments, their scores, what they're doing, you know, and obviously they were noticing this method was growing, not just obviously in the U S but it was growing worldwide because it was out there internationally yeah. as well. And so this idea with Tony um, and Dave was to create a competition called the CrossFit games and actually apply this method in a way that could be measured. Mm -hmm. And that was really big because you know, to have a com competition, you have to find a way to measure it and standardize it. And when you're talking about exercises and fitness, like how do we standardize these movements to, um, you know, be uh, scored, yep. right? And so, and that's really part of it being a functional movement is that they have a clear start and finish and a standard. And so long story short, in 2007 came about the, uh, the first CrossFit Games, 
where um, they basically just put it out on CrossFit.com saying is like a free invite. There was no qualification process. And it was just like a free for all. Hey, you know, you, you know, Hey, you want to claim to be the fittest person in the world, you know, come to aromas, California at the ranch and compete at this CrossFit games. And in its infancy there, um, came about this, this new idea of like, what does it mean to be the fittest person in the world? Yep. Yeah. And you know, if I could hop in a time machine, I'd be pretty competitive at that first CrossFit Games. <laughs> yes, I would, would be. I would be like, it's been so interesting to see it evolve. Like, because like you were saying, it started out as just like this community event where anybody could go. And like, if you can get one muscle up, like you're going to get pretty far in the 2007 CrossFit Games. Like the way it's evolved, like is pretty impressive. Um, and now it's just like a, you know, the, now like the level of, athletes are are like very impressive but those early early crossfit like games at the raw. ranch were very raw but so cool like so cool so fun so and the, so these tests in 2007 and again they're 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 making the, the initial claim of like what does it mean to be the fittest person in the world mm -hmm. and so like at that time what do you who would you think is the fittest person in the world you're probably thinking you know olympic athletes you know, people who are super strong or like a marathon runner, but like there was nothing ever at that time or really ever that like standardized, like what that meant to be the yeah. fittest. I mean, they looked at, um, the Catholics, right. They, yes. they, they, they were like, okay, that would maybe be a standard because they're like the most balanced, but there was never, ever a test for that. Yeah. And the idea is like, balance like who is a master of all trades like who can you know like who is not a master of one and i think that's where like the people who are most competitive at the games usually don't even win events like they just yep. are consistent you know in each event and like they have this balanced approach which you know when we take this into what we do at mfp it's like keeping that balanced approach like not mm -hmm. specializing but specializing yes. and not specializing yes and that's always a big thing that Gra uh, glassman said within the method is like specializing and not specializing is to be able to you know take whatever task is that was at hand and that was actually one of the themes in the first in that 2000 crossfit 2007 crossfit games which was uh, Dave had a hopper. It was basically like a, I guess that's what you call it, like yep. those spinning wheels and have a bunch of different movements and reps and, you know, loadings, all in this hopper. And he basically would start around, would pick it out, have a movement. It was like rowing at a, you know, moderate distance, which was a thousand meters. And then, he, you know, did a little, he yep. picked out pull-ups and then he did it again. He picked out push jerks and it was row 1000 meters, following into five rounds of 25 pull-ups and seven push jerks at, you know, a heavy weight. It was 135, 95, which now is anybody can almost do, you know, that's been doing CrossFit for a few years, but like that being that initial test one, there was an unknown, they didn't, no one, no one knew it was going to happen yep. with that workout. You just pulled it out of the hopper. It would, had a lot of different elements, like a hundred pull-ups or 125 pull-ups, which is a lot, you know, push jerks, pretty heavy for them at that time. Um, and so like, that was one of the tests. And then the other test was like doing the CrossFit total, which is like a max effort squat, um, deadlift and strict press. Yep. And then the, the final workout was do a 5k run over like the hills in California with all the elements of nature and all these things. So like there's only three tests that year. And again, like you said, how it's evolved, it was, I mean, if you look at it how it is now, I mean, it's ridiculous. And we'll talk a little bit more into like, you know, this evolution, but um, this timeline from like 2007 now on to 2024, uh, you know, you really can't compare the athlete to what it, to what it's become because um, after that year, they started to start to create, you know, qualifications and yeah. standards and more, ways to really bring this CrossFit Games and the sport into uh, a legitimate sport and a legitimate test of fitness because after that first year, it kind of just really blew up um, and these kind of led into those peak years of CrossFit. Yeah, and like really, you know, for someone who is 
new to CrossFit and still a little confused about the games, like best way to put it, it is like the one yearly way you could truly measure fitness mm -hmm. across, you know, all modalities. So it's measured, it's, you know, high level now, but it's measuring fitness, you know, across every different plane and like having a bunch of people come together and just test it, like testing their fitness. Um, and like now we could talk about, you know, our members obviously partake in some level of the CrossFit Games every every spring mm -hmm. when we go through the Open because now that's a, you know, we can go about how the flow is now. Yeah, I mean, this timeline of, of, of CrossFit really, you know, the event, like I said, they had to, um, well, I would say first is you guys can do some homework too. Yeah. So like even in 2008, 2009, there's, there's a documentary called Every Second Counts. If you haven't seen it, watch it i mean it's 2000 it's the 2008 crossfit games and it's raw oh, yeah. i mean it's like raw, like and it's just so you guys know as beginners the tests change every year i mean obviously to the open the workouts are different every year it's not always the same workout that's what makes it fitness that's what makes it you know having a variety and balance to be able to take on these tests but um in the years of i believe 2010 2011 um they started to find ways to like, cause more people were wanting to participate. So they had to have more of a different qualification process. And so they have these things called sanctionals and these things called regionals. And then 2011 started the process of the CrossFit open, which is to pre present a worldwide online competition to qualify people to go to a step called regionals which would then lead to the CrossFit game. So obviously it went from like a free, free for all, anybody can show up to like, oh wow, like people were interested, like the tests are changing and now we have to have this thing called the Open. And again, the Open's evolved in its own particular way worldwide to be very um, scalable for almost anybody in a CrossFit gym. But at those earlier days, you know, the, the goal for the Open was primarily for finding the fittest person in the world. And I just want to make that very clear is like that is the purpose of the CrossFit Games, finding the fittest individuals in the world. So it was meant to be they were meant to be tests that would challenge the norm of the daily CrossFit affiliate athlete to, you know, learn a new skill, for example, like, a, you know, a certain loading, a, a, you know, muscle up or, you know, pull up or something that that was more challenging that could be progressed into the next stages, which would be the regionals, which would be progressed into the next stages of the CrossFit games. And, you know, you were starting to see like CrossFit pull interest from so many different backgrounds of, of sport and individuals and of areas of fitness for the people that wanted to like actually prove themselves. Yeah. And that's how people became really intrigued in CrossFit. And I would say the CrossFit games, those earlier years from like 2010 to maybe like 2014, 15 were really um, important for the growth of the CrossFit brand overall because of the, because of how big the CrossFit games were and how much effort they were putting into the media and overall of like getting people intrigued into, you know, you know, what CrossFit games is and, you know, for better or for worse, how that eventually developed. But um, it was definitely a big thing in those early days of how like it attracted people um, to, you know, just be intrigued about like what CrossFit is. Yeah. And I think a big part of that was like earlier on, like when I first started doing CrossFit like 10 years ago, like these like really peak games years, like the CrossFit motto was like forging elite fitness. Like they yes. use that all the time. And like, honestly, like I felt like, yeah, it it was maybe some people didn't love the headline, but I feel like it was helpful at that mm -hmm. time because people wanted that. Like people wanted to find the one thing where like you could become the fittest person you possibly could. And like of course you could like mm -hmm. have you could kind of run with that in negative and unhealthy directions right. especially, but overall the premise like that was the appeal. Like people wanted mm -hmm. to be like the fittest possible, fittest on earth like mm -hmm. and actually measure it and get results for it yeah i mean i can relate to like that was in 2012 when i first started like that's what attracted me to crossfit mm -hmm. because it gave me an option to you know find a, a sport or an activity to like challenge myself and 
Um, you know, and also a few things about the CrossFit Games too. Like it wasn't just, um, you know, an individual fitness on earth. Like eventually, kind of going back to some details of how the CrossFit Games was. It, I mean, it was an original test to find a male and a female. Mm. So not just one person, like to find the fittest male, the fittest female. Um, and then eventually that led into having, you know, the fittest team of individuals. There would be a group, you know, of, of uh, three guys, three girls to make a team. Um, then that led into uh, over the years of having the fittest, you know, masters athletes, which would be individuals within age categories from, 40 to 45, 45 to 50, 50 to 55, 55 to 60. Um, then the team changing like to two guys and two girls and then finding the fittest um, adaptive athlete who has a disability. Mm. Um, and so like the games really, again, like you said, became this festival over the years to, you know, not just find like, the, again, the highlight, the big highlight is like that male and female fittest in the world. Right, because of what they endure, but there were so many subcategories of how that came, especially with the teams. Yeah, um, that's kind of like where I also I had my first start was doing like team competition because, um, again, like being the fittest in the world and competing even like at a regional level, the sub games category was really, really difficult in terms of like the fitness you need to acquire because of CrossFit being such a, a balanced approach. Um, and yeah, it just it just totally evolved in, in in so many ways in terms of like how the what the tests actually were. Yeah. So let's just say, for example, we talk about 2007, you know, it was over like a weekend and they did three events, you know, over, you know, those, you know, five to six years coming up, like it went from like three events to like nine events yep. over three or four days. And then eventually, I think they event one year in like 2015 or 16, they had up to like 12 or 13 events, you know, over, you know, a six day period from like a Wednesday through a Sunday. So in terms of like the amount of tests that they endure, because people were getting more fit because they were able to one endure more, but they had to test different elements and different skills to really standardize like, okay, are we actually finding the fittest person in the world? And no matter what the tests were, no matter how far-fetched or maybe, you know, if it wasn't pleasing to the crowd, the fittest person always came out on top. Yeah. You know, and I think that's always, always a goal. And, yeah. um, you know, it was always about just like having that balance in the test of that, how they change every year. And, um, you know, we can kind of go in a little bit later about like some of our favorite ones, but any, uh, you yeah. Know, well, you know, when it, even when you think about like, yeah, the goal is to find like the fittest man, fittest woman, fittest team, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, I think something important to keep in mind for our members, like, you know, thinking about it in a little bit of a different perspective too. like, for example, when you started CrossFit, like you were always a higher level athlete than me. You were someone who like knew you could advance pretty far and you've gotten pretty far. Like I'm someone who knows that like, that's not my goal. That's not for me. But I still love like there's this idea of consistently measuring and testing mm -hmm. that the game season allows you to do regardless if mm -hmm. you're at your level, regardless if you're at my level, regardless if you're adaptive. Mm -hmm. And there's this idea of every year since for me since 2014, I do these tests Sometimes they reoccur, sometimes they're new tests, and mm. I see where I'm at, and I see personally how I've grown. And I think like that in the CrossFit game season, like, yeah, of course, like I'm an average guy who like who loves fitness and you know loves to mm -hmm. take advantage of my like loves to be as healthy as I can. Like I know I'm never gonna be a games athlete, but I see that like journey of like growing and like every year I've gotten better. And this year for me it was just like a big accomplishment. Like quarterfinals pool expanded and I was able to make it like I wanted to be in the top 75% and like that was an awesome goal for me so it just it's a really helpful time of year to help you like put your goals in perspective and value this idea of measuring and testing fitness because it measuring and testing like are valuable when done correctly yeah and that's exactly why we do the open every year I mean obviously what CrossFit is in its essence is more for the community and like health and wellness. But 
um, again, it standardizes, and the games allowed us to do this, is to standardize like what it means to actually have a balanced fitness base. Mm-hmm. And so when we do the Open, and like Joe, now, you said we now have like quarterfinals, which makes it a little bit more inclusive. Then there's semifinals, then the games. Now there's more tests and tiers. But uh, the beauty of the CrossFit Games is that they, they do that. Yeah. Right? They allow us to really look at our, our, our development and even for the CrossFit Games athletes, like over years, they've test and retest previous Games athletes. Like that one workout, like I said, from the Hopper from 2007, they retested in 2013. Mm-hmm. It's like the very first workout of that 2013 CrossFit Games, and the athletes smoked it. Yeah. Like people couldn't even finish that workout in 2007. Like all the Games athletes that qualified that year, it was like a warm up for them. Yep. And so that's a really important part of the methodology in, in, in general, you know, measurable, observable, and repeatable fitness. And so like for you guys, let's just say, for example, now at the gym, if you're trying to apply to like what we do on a day-to-day basis, like we just did nasty girls, you know, I have to really like reframe myself when I say that workout, by the way, I, t- I, t- I said to everybody at the gym, I said, do you guys all watch the nasty girls video? And I realized after like coaching three classes that how that came off. So it's a workout on YouTube of of the three women performing the workout, okay? And so you all know that you completed Nasty Girls or we did Fight Gone Bad or we've done some classic workouts. And we'll see more of those in the gym. But just know that, you know, we use benchmarks and things like that to reevaluate. Maybe next time you do it, you do the same progression, but you go faster. Maybe the next time you do it, you do maybe the heavier weight that's closer to prescribed or a skill that's you know, maybe a little bit more challenging. Yeah. And so we want to use these as measurable tests. And also the important part that the games does is they standardize it. So if you see them at the CrossFit Games or even like we do in the Open, and in general, like we have a judge, yeah. right? And so it's that's really a valuable part of it. People will be like, oh, why do you have a judge? Why can't I just work out like... That's the part of it, like doing obviously all your reps. So that way we have an even playing field to really assess Um, and make sure to say like, hey, like your squat's not below parallel or making sure that you're locking out or making sure that your chin's over the bar. Like the CrossFit Games athletes have to adhere to that to a maximum. Like we're a little flexible for you for the open, but like you'll see when the judges counting the reps and they go like this, they go no rep, like they have to do that again because it's valuable to set a standard to the movement. And you will not see this in really any other fitness competition worldwide where like each in, like each competitor has an individual judge that keeps them accountable to doing the reps. And you'll see, for example, at this year's CrossFit Games or doing one of the workouts as a hero workout called CHAD. We've done it at the gym before, which is a thousand step ups for time. And like, that's going to be a really hard workout to hold a standard because you have to like stand up and open your hip at the top of the box every single rep. And so like, can you still maintain intensity while maintaining integrity of the standard of the movement? So not getting all too much on the uh, tangent, but you know, the games allows us to find a way to standardize our fitness, provide measurable, observable, you know, fitness. And also gives us like a, 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 you know, something fun. Yeah. I think it's just that that's really the best part about it. It is like, can you look at, you know, the CrossFit games and find like excitement and motivation in that versus like, oh, well, I'll never be able to do this. Like, yeah, yeah no duh. You know, yeah. we'll talk about like what you have to do to actually get at that level. But like, no duh. But what you can also do is be like, oh, wow. Like I'm. I essentially do what they do at a very scaled down level on the gym every time I come to the gym. And just so you know, like all of them had to do the open too. You can't go to the games without doing the open, without doing quarterfinals. Like they don't just go right to the games. Like they have to do that every single year. And so they are uh, a very important part of our CrossFit community because of their development and what they go through, but also like their story as well. And I said this in a previous podcast, like their story of development, some of these athletes that compete now, like you should have seen them when they first done CrossFit and trying to lift the bar, you know, do a pull up and, you know, do all these feats. Like they they didn't just 
it wasn't an easy ride into it. Yeah. Everyone had a, a, a process that took a lot of time in their journey to, to really dial in a lot of different things. And so, yeah, their commitment level is obviously much different, but their story is not much more different from ours. Um, and so like, you know, when you watch it, like you get to admire that, you get to use it as motivation and, um, you know, you will even see some of these things drip into like the way I would think about like presenting some of these elements into the affiliate, let's say for example, today, like we did the overhead sled drag Yep. that first showed itself in the 2013 CrossFit games in a workout called the burn and run, which is actually one of my favorite workouts, which was the very first workout of that year. It was a grueling workout where they did a three mile run. They flipped this pig, which is just a, basically like a long mechanical tire, quote unquote, for a hundred yards. They took a log, they carried it for like a mile. And then they finished with a sled where they had to hold it overhead and they had to drag it and, and push it. Um, and so like, you know, some of these ideas and elements do drip into the affiliates, you know, as long as the owners like find value in that, which I do, and you'll see skills and things and concepts and maybe even a workout from time to time that we can use as an affiliate to, you know, express our fitness. Yeah. And I think when we like, as we get into like specific games events, this idea of like constantly varied mm -hmm. is really important because like, you know, sometimes like, you know, I know that like a lot of times like people will want like that classic CrossFit, like they'll want barbells, pull-ups, mm -hmm. but like, oh, you yeah. know, but like that is real, like expecting to have like something that fits into a CrossFit box every day really is not very CrossFit like, like when you look at the games, I mean, like you were just talking about like carrying logs, like all these like functional movements that are so varied and like so unpredictable, like that, you know, people have to like really be balanced to tackle any sort of challenge. And I think, you know, that mindset is really appropriate. Like I remember when I went to the games as a fan in 2018, like a lot of athletes were throwing a fit over having to do the marathon row. Like mm, they were just, yeah, I love it. They were the mar it was a marathon row, um, which was, yeah, which is rowing a marathon. And it took like three hours. Like Nora and I went, we literally went to the start of the event, left, went out to dinner, came back and it's still so had like an hour left. Like we, we went, <laughs> left, came back. Cause they were just row, row, row. But it was like, it was so cool just to like, see like, I mean, this devastated athletes. Like they, they, there were guys like fitter than I'll ever be. And shout out to a couple members at MFP, Steph Vitro and Dan Greenspun, who did a marathon road yeah, a couple of years ago. One, yeah. Possibly bringing that back. I would love to do that again if anybody would like to do it with me. Um, but just like they're always throwing different stuff, and I like, and that's what it's all about. Um, I've done the marathon row as well, and it's pretty brutal. Uh, I love that you pointed this out because, um, and just so you know, I mean, right now the, the main programmer for the CrossFit Games is Dave Castro. So the original, like I said, it was Dave Castro and Tony Buddy that eventually evolved to just being Dave Castro. Then Dave took like a year or two off and then Dave came back to officially do it. And so like this guy is the original, you know, mind for creating CrossFit Games and the fittest people on earth. And um, you know, a lot of people love and hate Dave Castro for a lot of reasons for who he is, but like even he's, he's gained so much heat over the years for some of the workouts that he's programmed, but he never fails. I'll just put he never, ever fails. Like, yeah, there's some trial and error with testing, but he always gets the same exact data points and stimulus of like who the top people are. And the one year Dave got a lot of backfire and hate which i love was the year 2017 and it started with the open actually where he started to introduce like no barbells mm -hmm. and it was all it was the year of the dumbbells and odd objects and so that regionals and i was that was my first regionals that i qualified for it was all dumbbells dumbbell snatch dumbbell um dumbbell overhead squats we did heavy farmer carry with the kettlebell uh, with kettlebell deadlifts, um, sandbag, and it was just everyone was like, 
this isn't a complete test, you know, but like that's also part of it, like the variance, like yeah. you said. And yeah, there were like heavy objects, maybe not like a one rep maximum of a barbell lift, but you were still able to create the stimulus that you need to have a valid test of fitness to proceed the next people into the next range. And like, for example, the one year uh, at the CrossFit Games, it, instead of like a one rep max, you know, barbell lift, it was a one rep sandbag to the shoulder. And yep. They loved it. Right. And so like, how do we utilize all these different elements, you know, uh, in terms of the what's being used, whether if it's just, you know, instead of a barbell, is it maybe a thick bar? Maybe instead of doing bar muscle ups on a pull up bar, it's over a log. Um, like the one year you went in 2018, they did a workout called chaos, Oh yeah, which was the athletes had no idea where they, what they were even going to do when they went out on the floor, they went out on the floor, it's three, two, one, go. They move up to the, whatever station. If it's a skier, they move up to it. The judge goes, you know, you got to do 30 calories. All right. Yeah. They do it. They move up to a bar. Uh, you got to do pull ups. Great. Oh, you got to go up to this thing called a snail and you got to like the cool things that the games they have are like these weird odd objects and they have to like roll this heavy yeah. thing. And, um, and so like that workout, they had no idea how many reps or what scheme or whatever they were doing. They just had to go. And so that's like also a beautiful part of variance is that the games has the unknown and unknowable. For example, the 2014 games at the very, very end, um, the final test was they go out on the floor and then they're going to find out. And it was like 60 clean and jerks for time. And it was the double grace. Um, and they didn't know that. And like, that was just going to be their final test when they go out on the floor. Um, and so like, again, these are parts of that Dave Casher brings about into the CrossFit games that really speak to the methodology in itself, like not specializing, um, you know, being prepared for anything. Um, you know, they've had so many, like every year they usually go out in the water and they swim or they have mm -hmm. a pool event. They have some sort of long distance element. They have, you know, either some sort of bike ride, you know, if it's like a cycle bike or dirt bike. Um, they've done so many different elements of like using different styles of bars and, and carries instead of sandbags, they'll use like these jugs and like the one year in Madison, they, you know, did the run and they had to carry the, you know, odd object sandbags all the way up, you know, the, up the Capitol, up, up the Capitol yeah. building, you know, it's just, again, I could go on and on with so many of these tests that they've done over the years to validate, like when you see all these weird things at MFP kind of bringing it back to mm -hmm. like our, our daily local affiliate and how for me, someone being very inspired by the CrossFit games and what they can do for our community is like some of these tests and how they utilize them. Um, you know, we kind of think about, I think about in that same way of how I program sometimes, and, you know, when we do a lot of the non-sexy things, just know that like, there's so much value into how it transfers into developing, you know, this variance and developing your skill, the ability to, you know, perform some of these things that they might essentially do yeah. um, at the CrossFit games. And I think another, like another important part of the games and something else to value it is um it's so like these are the, truly the fittest people in the world who are doing this and it's really hard for them really hard for them like and going back to like you know yourself like i'll have like especially like newer members or the people who are coming for the first time like this is really hard for me and like mm -hmm. i think there's something to think about where it's always like it's a great thing and it's a really like constantly inspiring thing like it's always going to be hard mm. because it in, it's infinitely scalable like as you grow the progressions just grow and challenge more with you and like having something be hard all the time like you know being challenged regularly is a good thing you know mm. and you know just seeing people at the highest level being very 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 challenged yeah. is a good thing well that's actually an amazing point to bring up because if one of the best things that Dave Castro does is that he introduces elements every single year that the athletes cannot perform. Yep. 
he does it almost every year, or it's too it's almost too standard where like they really really struggle with it. Um, and it's and like people sometimes get like annoyed at it, like oh wow, like I'm watching them like fail and all these things. But the that's the best part of the games because that's how we set mm-hmm. an evolution and a, and a the, it, it constantly challenges the threshold of like what can the what can a human physically accomplish yeah you know some of these examples would be um like the pegboard mm-hmm. one year they had a pegboard it was 2013 or four, it was 2014 they had the pegboard for the first time the athletes could not do a pegboard and it was like oh wow you're the fittest well great like that's the idea like you cannot be the fittest if you cannot perform this physical yep. test um you know not too long ago they did the the crossover double under right and like nobody could do that like there was one guy like kid you know athlete that was there and he was just like crushing them because like he just had like that weird skill like now all the athletes can do it yep right and so like everybody complained at that moment but guess what it forced people to do oh wow when i go back i gotta actually practice and i i i'm i have a weakness Mm -hmm. now we have to come back to balance right and i have to think of my fitness as a whole like so every year setting a standard at a weight that maybe athletes can't lift yep and then they have to go back to their training or setting, you know, uh, a distance of, of you know, performance in a, on a run or something like that or a volume of reps that are really hard to achieve. Yeah. Um, and then you'll see things like that are, are very common. Like many years they've done Merck, variations of Merck. You'll see your typical CrossFit test. Like you might just see a basic, you know, CrossFit girls workout. Um, you know, and so like, those are also a very vital part of, of standardizing at the CrossFit games. Well, they might see it like the semifinals or quarterfinals or whatever, but those are still all very valid tests. So again, it's like setting a threshold of, of, of movement standards and all those things. I love that they do it every year. Yeah. And like, I think a lot of, especially for like very high level athletes, like yeah. a little bit, it's could be an ego thing like, oh, like yeah. when they can't do something and like i just think it's a good lesson like there will always be something you can't do or yeah. always be something you're not that good at and like that's the point um yeah they had uh, so many good things the uh like, oh the climb the uh ring handstand push-up oh my there. gosh that was, that's still like i mean that was crazy yeah that the one year they had ring handstand push-ups where you would actually have to muscle up to them and then like and almost like a planche into it like they would yes. flip on over yeah yep. and they, that was actually first introduced in 2010 2010 crossfit game so mm-hmm. like those athletes had years to figure that out before they actually threw back into the games but like yeah it's just again they made like the one year they did legless rope climbs and everybody was just like couldn't figure it out and like you know that's a standard oh my gosh it's it's so cool to see and um yeah, I'm, I'm super grateful for, for, you know, even experiencing some of those challenges myself. Um, like the one year at regionals, like we did handstand walks over an obstacle and like, I couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Like I was just, I was just staring at it the whole time. Like I, you know, that was just a gap in my fitness. That's just some, a weak area. And, um, you know, it just showed the show where I was lacking. Yeah. Um, show where you grow. I yeah. Mean, like for me, I remember the one open workout my when i first started doing crossfit like i was a couple years in it was the 10 rounds of 35 dubs nine thrusters and like yeah i could not do like my double unders were so bad like i could not i was that was the worst workout and then now i'm like to me i'm like that's like my favorite open workout like yeah yeah, yeah, it's just like you find these things and you look back and you're like man like (laughs) i'm like i've grown a lot like now this is it's not it's not it's still hard like it's still a burner but like it's like a strength for me now. Oh my gosh. That's actually really interesting you brought that up. Cause that's actually a great way to like have a perspective at the, at the gym daily. Like we're going to have things that are going to challenge you. And, and like, that's the idea. Yeah. And another fun fact about that workout that year, which was 2017, they brought that workout back at the games, but it was at a heavier load. Yep. It was 10 rounds, same amount of double unders, but the, the nine thrusters were heavier. And they were beating like you know people that do open workout at the lighter scores like all over the world. So it was really cool to see. And again, like noticing how these workouts kind of uh, you know all play a path. So I figured to talk about workouts just quickly. Maybe 
for us to touch on some of like our favorite CrossFit games, you know, parts of history or workouts in general. And one thing I wanted to note on it, because if you look up the CrossFit games, you're probably first, like if you went on Google and you look up CrossFit games, you're probably going to see Rich Froning, Matt Frazier, Tia Claire Toomey, Annie Thor's daughter, like these names of individuals like pop up. Um, these are all previous CrossFit Games champions over over the years. Um, and so like the era of Rich Froning, which was like 2010 to 2014, um, as an individual, were really my favorite years because that was also the beginning years for my CrossFit journey. And I thought the 2012 CrossFit Games was by far, if I still look at all the games over the past years, like I thought that was one of the most well-balanced years. And there was one test that I just loved watching and it was on like the football field in, in Carson, California. And they, it was like five rounds where they pushed the sled 20 yards, jogged back to a rope, did rope climbs, 20 yards, rope climbs, 20 yards, rope climbs, 20 yards, rope climbs. I just thought that was like such a cool event. You know, like to be able to like to push. It was like a football sled. Yeah. So that's one reason probably why I liked it because it was like it was like and again an odd football sled that you would see like you know linemen push, you know, and like they have to adapt to that element and they had this like twenty foot rope climb which is like super high up. Yeah, that's high. You know, and so like they had again these little elements that um, I thought that were really cool. Like they had the D ball when they like parallel handstand push ups. They had this like clean ladder. And again, they almost like test like, you know, Olympic lift almost every year. So they have things that are repeatable. But um, yeah, I just thought that was like a really cool year and a really good timeline of CrossFit competition before like Matt Frazier and Tia Claire Toomey came in and they were like winning every year. Um, <laughs> but still, like there's also so many CrossFit stories of the athletes that make it to the games that like actually really tell the true story of like what CrossFit is, not just the champions. Yeah. Um, that I always love looking into as well. Yeah. And I think, you know, as we like <clears throat> apply this to ourselves and to you know, like members apply it to their own lives and every person like thinks about it. One thing I think is just important to consider is like, don't think about training like a games athlete. Like, although <laughs> like that is one thing that like, especially, no. you know, no. like, Although CrossFit is infinitely scalable, like, you know, the games athletes are a very specific breed and like they are training for, in a very specific way for a, like a, a structured period of time. Like, you know, it's not like it's so easy to like see this and get super motivated, like especially if you're new, like a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about CrossFit stories. Like when I was new, like you see that and you're like, that's awesome. Like I'm going to get like all the programming i'm gonna be in the gym for five hours like you don't have to do that um and like it that's something that you know you know we don't see a lot of that at mfp but that is a thing you know people get super excited about it and like there's a difference between like motivation and then like doing what's really best for you in mm -hmm. your own growth well i was even just looking at um this clip just showed up on my feed today with cole sager and Cole Sager is uh, like a OG CrossFit Games athlete. I think it's almost like his ninth year competing, which is like, yeah. amazing. Like he's been doing it for almost every year. Um, and he just was talking about when he was being interviewed, like I approach my training so much different now, like less is more. Um, and now he can say that because he's a seasoned games athlete. Like if you, if you were just someone regularly, who's like, I want to go to the CrossFit Games. And you have like no background of competing in CrossFit or general, like you will probably, it would be, I don't want to say you, you can't cause I'm not a can't person, but it'd be really, really, really hard to make the CrossFit games. Like Joe, like now in your fitness, like, yeah, you probably could compete in like 20, 2007, 2008, you know, maybe 2009 a little bit, but like even that is still like for me to even compete in, you know, some of those earlier years would still be hard for me, but um you know the time and effort you would need to develop everything like because again we talked about the evolution of the crossfit games yeah and like how fit they've actually come and so like the only really way you can really compete now is if you have skin in the game for a long time and so you'll see the athletes competing you know a lot of them are have been doing crossfit for a long time 
and developing the methodology and actually committing towards like being a CrossFit Games athlete. So like you can't just come in and do it anymore. It's yeah. not like that. Like you really would have to commit your whole life to doing yeah. it, right? You'd have to, you know, quit your job probably. Like you, you have to train as a you know, CrossFit Games athlete, get sponsors, eat, sleep, recover, have a very dialed in program. Like, yeah, you probably have to train more than one session a day, but like for the most people, like we were saying, going back to like, that doesn't serve us. Yeah. That, that doesn't serve your, your overall health and wellness and your overall fitness. It's probably more of a detriment to anything. Like all we need is that one hour to really maximize our physical potential in our own unique way. But when you admire across the games athlete, yeah. like just know that what they have to endure I mean, it's, it's very high level and like, you'd have to, you have to basically like commit your whole life to be able to do that. Yeah. You know, just put it in perspective, like focus on your own goals and you know, your own, like, just think about your own life. Like what you do, like, what are you doing this for? Like your goal is to be healthier, live longer and live better. Right. Like that's the ultimate goal. So just like whoever you are, just like, think about your goals. Think about like, what matters to you, how much, like your family, your career, whatever case may be. And then just like show up in any way you can. And like, don't think about what, like, don't think about what other, like Mm -hmm. what these like elite games athletes are doing. Just think about your own journey. And that's the way, that's the approach. And you could still do that. Like while appreciating how cool it is to see very high level athletes compete. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, just still just, always bring it back to like when you're thinking about yourself like your own life is and your own values like that's that's what matters and then just enjoy enjoy the rest yeah and like just so and like so you guys know like we're we're big at i mean obviously we're talking about the games like we're big advocates for what the crossfit games do because again i want to emphasize like that is a part of our community like if you go to the games or like a big cross event like it's a festival it's fun yeah like I'd rather go to a festival with a bunch of fit ass people, you know, than in just like they, there's muscles everywhere. Yeah. You know, you gotta love it. And then like it's fun and like celebrates, you know, fitness. And I think that's something we try to do with like our CrossFit Open every year is just to find a way to celebrate fitness and to really make it fun for the community and um, you know, just you know that we value for what the games do. You know, we don't encourage living a lifestyle like the CrossFit games. And, you know, I like to maybe take notes and things that they do with the games, maybe try to like for fun, like play, plug and play into our community. Yeah. But, um, you know, you know, you know, we don't need to, you know, uh, create a culture of the CrossFit games. You yeah. know, we want to use it as a tool to help us stay motivated and inspired for our CrossFit journeys. Yeah. No, just enjoy it. Appreciate it. And just keep being your best self. Yeah. Love it. I think that's pretty much all we got here today. I think we're going to wrap it up. I think that was a really good idea for us to, you know, just really touch on the CrossFit Games, um, you know, for you guys this week. And maybe we'll do a little recap of the CrossFit Games just so Joe and I have a little, uh, you know, accountability to, to watch them. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I mean, otherwise, just just stay tuned for those. We'll post it on the Facebook group. Um, and I'll have some resources for you guys to watch the CrossFit Games after we post this podcast. And, um, yeah, we're just excited for you guys to really, you know, see what they're doing. So that way you can, you know, take that back into what you do with it on a day-to-day basis. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, we're going to wrap this up here. And, um, yeah, we'll see you next time. There are really no other big up gym events other than just, just showing up, All right? We're getting close to the summer um, ending here in our summer phase and getting ready for the fall. So I don't want to say, you know, summer's almost over, but... Fall vibes. Uh, fall vibes are coming. All, All right. right. So enjoy your last few weeks of summer. We'll see you next week. Coach Marco here. Coach Joe. Peace. Peace out. Love you.